Q&A. Our guest, John Doerr, talks about his experiences serving as Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights in the Kennedy and Johnson administrations. John Doerr, when you think back about your life and your involvement in public service, what's the first memory that comes to mind? The time I worked in the Civil Rights Division. In the Justice Department? In the Justice Department. And why? Well, because uh, I had the opportunity, the great chance to work on a very important problem in American government. We had a sit situation in their 60s where really we didn't have an honest system of self-government. And through the efforts of the everybody in the country, including the Civil Rights Division, the Voting Rights Act came in 1965, and the power of that act has been established last November 4th, when for the first time really every citizen in the United States voted or had the opportunity to vote freely. And well, that was a great thing. What was your reaction when Barack Obama was elected president? Well, I was, it was just so re rewarding because uh, uh, I think back at what the situation was when I arrived in Washington in 1960. Um, countless black citizens in the South couldn't vote. They were second-class citizens from cradle to grave. The discrimination was terrible, brutal, and to think that that's over. It's done. That period of American history is over, finished. I want to show some still photographs from your past and get you to give us a synopsis of what do we see in this picture right okay. there. The picture there is at the Justice Department. There's, there's the Attorney General Robert Kennedy and Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, Burke Marshall, and I'm standing. And what was your role at that time? I was the first assistant to Burke in the Civil Rights Division. And what's your memory of Burke Marshall? My memory of Burke is, is that he was a terrific lawyer, the best I've ever known. A person like Burke Marshall comes around, comes around about once every 600 years. He was that good. What about Bobby Kennedy? He was terrific, too. The two of them, from the first day that Bobby Kennedy came into office, he was committed to doing something about the discrimination in voting. Am I guessing right that you were about 40 years old in that picture? That's right. Let's go to the next still shot. And you're there on the right. Who's on the left and who's in the middle? James McShane, if the chief U.S. Marshal's on the left, and James Meredith is in the middle. It's a shot sometime during the time that we, <coughs> uh, Meredith, entered the University of Mississippi in 1962. And what's your role? I was the first assistant in the Civil Rights Division at that time, and I was asked to accompany James Meredith when he entered the university. What was the significance of him entering the University of Mississippi? Well, the, no, no black student had ever gone to the University of Mississippi. This was the first time, this was the first time <coughs> any integration of schools in Mississippi had occurred. This was 1962. This, this was 1962. And what do you, what's the, the first memory that comes to mind about what happened in and around this episode? <coughs> Well, the trouble that occurred at Sunday night after Meredith finally got on the campus, uh, there was a, a bad uh, situation. It got to the point where there was rioting, and it was fortunate that as few people got hurt as they di as did. Two people were killed. Two people were killed. And your role at that time was to do what around James Meredith, and how well did you know him? <clears throat> well, I'd try, I, I, I had met him a week or so before, and I accompanied him to uh, Jackson, Mississippi a week before to try to register at the state office building. Uh, that was not successful. The government, governor had re uh, rejected him, turned him back. Uh, we then went to Memphis and waited for the opportunity to uh, enter the university. Uh, we went down on one morning, and uh, we were turned back at the at the one of the entrances to the university. Second time we went down was two or three days later, and uh, we got about halfway from Memphis to, to 
Oxford, or to, to the university, and uh, we were told to go back because it wasn't safe enough for him to enter. And then finally we went back on a Sunday afternoon and came in on a quiet Sunday afternoon and uh, we went to a dormitory there about 100 or 200 yards behind the main office building called the Lyceum Building and uh, got uh, James Meredith settled in his room in an inside room and so that it was really it would have been impossible for anybody to to harm him there and uh, then from that time on I moved from his his quarters to the Lyceum building through the evening another still photo from your past <clears throat> well that's uh, that's me that's a situation that occurred at Jackson Mississippi after Medgar's Medgar Evers funeral uh, the black friends of Medgar Evers wanted to have a march down through the city of Jackson, peaceful, quiet, dignified, and uh, the, the police chief said it was all right for them to march from the church to downtown, but they couldn't go on the main street in Jackson. And so they crossed the main street and went into the black uh, areas where the black shops and black stores are. And then some of the kids decided that they wanted to march up the up the main street, and they went back to the intersection. And when the police saw that, they cordoned off the intersection with a row of police. And uh, then they started to be some rock throwing, and I have to be there, and so I walked out, and and uh, and everybody stopped. Uh -huh. Medgar Evers had been shot by James Beckwith, um, a, a racist fellow from from Mississippi. Medgar Evers was the NAACP, NAACP leader in Mississippi and a very excellent, wonderful man. And I knew him and had gone to get information from him beginning early in '61. Seen him many times between '61 and '63, and. I considered him a friend, and I went to his funeral. And, and he was 37 years old. At the time. I think so, yeah. And what happened when you went in the middle of the street? Did it actually stop the? It stopped. And and what then happened? Well, nothing happened. It just dispersed. People circulated around. Uh, the uh, nobody uh, before it before it stopped. Uh, there was a a line of uh, black uh, kids, black students, uh, that were up uh, well, kind of nose to nose to the police and were uh, wanting to know why why this, they couldn't march on the main street in Jackson peacefully. And uh, of course the police were not uh, responding at all, but they had this, this cordon of police across with a paddy wagon behind them. And then and this may be my speculation. I s suspect that one of the black kids may have got too close to the police line and bumped up one of the policemen. And that resulted in the police beginning to grab the kids and put, put them through the line and into the back of the paddy wagon. At the same time, the, the county sheriff's uh, people, the deputy sheriffs, had pulled up and and reinforce the line on the side, each side of the sidewalks, not in the street. The police were in the street, and they were on the sidewalks, so that it was store to store, so to speak, a line. And I was nervous about the sheriff's deputies. I didn't think that they had the same discipline that the city police did, and they had shotguns. And I was afraid someone was going to get hurt, and so. Uh, uh, I, I don't know what I was, what I really thought, except I thought that that it, it, it should be stopped. Why haven't you ever re written a book about this time in your life? I don't write. You can talk it. I know. I, I tell you, Brian. Uh, <clears throat> I think memories are awfully fallible, and uh, to me, uh, the history of that period is going to be. Uh, come from some historian that really digs into the records and gets the documents and uh, 
test the documents against people's memory. You really haven't done much in the way of appearing on television. You uh, Have you talked much about this at all to any historians on the record on a oral history or anything like that? Well, there's one, one group of one person who uh, asked me to do that uh, some years ago, and I was interviewed on, on tape for some time. Uh, I, f I, f I find it was somewhat uh, unsatisfying because uh, when I'm asked a question about something that happened down, down in Mississippi or Louisiana, uh, I like to be accurate. And uh, I often afterwards was frustrated that I hadn't done enough work and preparation for, for that interview to be satisfied about it. So I, I'm, I, I, I agreed to do this uh, today for you because I followed your program and I've got respect for it. And, uh, but otherwise, I don't, I don't do this. Well, actually, um, we're delighted to have you here. And you came to town, and the reason why we asked you, and we didn't know whether you'd say yes or not, you came to town to get a humanitarian award uh, given by the Coral Society of Washington at the Kennedy Center. Um, did you well, have to speak? Well, that was, did I what? Did you have to speak at this award ceremony? Well, I had to speak, yes. But I, uh, I tell you, when I was asked to, to accept that award, I said I would do it knowing that the award was really for the work of Burke Marshall and the Civil Rights Division during the time he served the government under Robert Kennedy. And uh, I don't have any hesitancy about speaking about Burke Marshall or about the whole, all the lawyers in the Civil Rights Division and the, everybody there. And it was a wonderful, wonderful experience in my life to be part of that. Let me put the bookends here. Born in 1921 in New Richmond, Wisconsin. Well, I'm born in 1921 in Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is just a 40, just miles, a 40 away. miles away from <laughs> Richmond, Wisconsin. Okay, we're going to come back and go over more of this, but you move ahead until in 1960 you were a Republican, it went to work in the Eisenhower administration, and stayed for seven years. Right, that's right. How See, long did you stay a Republican? <clears throat> I'm still a Republican. After all these years, you went through all this work with the Democratic administration and you stayed Republican. That's right. I'm a Lincoln Republican. What does that mean? Well, that means that we believe in an honest system of self-government. In 1960, uh, for the last, for 75, almost 100 years before that, uh, we had a t dishonest system of self-government. 110 percent of the people couldn't vote. And uh, you went to Princeton. Right. Where did you get your law degree? University of California at Berkeley. After that, 1967, um, we've got a, another photo I want to show uh, that people might recognize some of the players in this photo. That's in 1974 uh, when I was the special counsel for the House Judiciary Committee investigating the conduct of President Nixon. Uh, Hillary Clinton is standing next to me, and then uh, is, is, is next to her is Joe, Joseph Woods of uh, Oakland, California who was my associate uh, as counsel of the committee, counsel to the committee. Uh, we were law school uh, classmates. Now, you served in that position as counsel to Peter Rodino on the committee for how long? Well, I was from, I, I think, probably the 30th of December or 1st of January 2000, no, 19... 73, 1973, and then, then for the eight or nine months in 74. And the conclusion of that committee, the three articles that were passed by the committee, that it, when you read about your uh, role in that, some say that you were the one that convinced some of the Republicans to come over and vote with the Democrats against President Nixon. <clears throat> well, I don't think that's I don't think that's accurate. I think that the the weight of the evidence that was presented by the uh, uh, the, our, uh, the lawyers that worked for me uh, persuaded the uh, Republicans have persuaded all the committee members that voted yes on the impeachment articles to vote yes. We, uh, we set for ourselves a standard when we started to conduct the investigation. That standard was that we weren't going to be satisfied unless we got a two-thirds vote. 
uh, Peter Rodino did not want to get a, a just a bare majority with Democrats voting one way and Republicans the other. Or we wanted to persuade two thirds of that committee, so 37 people, that uh, uh, there was grounds for uh, recommending that the president be impeached. And that first vote was 27-10? I can't remember what it was, but it was a two thirds. It was two thirds. And required a number of Republicans to it, vote. Yes, it, yes, it did. What was the impact of that vote on the presidency? Well, I, I can't tell you what the impact was. I mean, did did that move this this pre? I mean, that vote came in what July of July of nineteen seventy four. Yes, and he quit August the eighth. Right, right. Did you did you feel that? You remember that moment as being the thing that tipped the scales for him? <clears throat> no, no, I don't. Uh, I, I I don't know what tipped the scales for him. And that experience for you? Have you done any work, written anything no. about that experience? No, no, I have not. Have you done any oral histories about that time? No, I don't think so. Well, I, 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 I can't say because I, when you use the word oral histories, does it mean every interview? Have I ever talked to anybody about it? I'm no, sure somebody I sits down and But I haven't sat down and said, hey, this is going to be your, your history of, of that period. How many lawyers worked for you? Thirty-five. I know this is another time, but do you remember how much money it's, you spent? How much money we how spent? Much, I mean, how much money was devoted to the investigation? <clears throat> well, not a heck of a lot. We didn't. Uh, we decided early on that that it w didn't make a very good sense for us to go out and conduct a further in, a new I investigation of the president's conduct. Uh, we saw our job as to pull together all of the investigations that had, cr had occurred that day and try to bring them together and sharpen them in a way that was as persuasive as possible if we thought the facts warranted. Back in 1987, this network covered a three-day conference in Oxford, Mississippi. Journalists got together to talk about civil rights. And uh, I want to run some video from that point, um, a gentleman by the name of Charles Dunnigan, who was a former publisher of the Macomb, Mississippi Enterprises Journal, talking about your work with in regard to James Meredith. After Governor Ross Barnett had had himself appointed registrar of the university, John and the federal marshal were taking Meredith to Barnett, I suppose, to get him registered. It was sometime during the proceedings that were going on. There stood John, over six feet tall, this big federal marshal, both white and this 135 black man in between them at, who had received all of this, all this national publicity. Governor Barnett's remarks were, which one of you is James Meredith? <laughs> What do you remember about Ross Barnett, the governor of Mississippi? Well, he was a showman, and uh, he uh, he was really very unhelpful uh, uh, to us in carrying out the responsibilities that the Justice Department had. Uh, the Attorney General and Burke uh, made every effort to uh, persuade the people of the state of Mississippi, the leaders of the state of Mississippi, that it was in their interest to cooperate and to comply with the, the federal uh, order of the court. Well, did, had there ever been a black person admitted to any Mississippi State University? No. This was the first one. And why was James Meredith the first one? Well, because he decided he was going to be get an education at the University of Mississippi. He was a very stubborn man, and I stay stubborn in a good word, he determined. And he w had been going to Dillard in New Orleans, which is a historically black college, right? and had, what, done a couple years and went on to Mississippi and did a couple years and graduated. Um, do you, are, he's still alive. Yes. Are you in touch with him at all? Do you ever talk to him? <clears throat> well, I, I was on a... I was uh, the last time I think I saw him. I was on a panel with him up at the Kennedy Center yes, in Boston uh, several years uh, ago. Uh, he's a 
He's a, he's James Meredith is his own man, and he's a, uh, quiet, determined, not a whiner, uh, uh, completely uh, convinced of what he's doing is the right things. Uh, he 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 follows his own course. He doesn't. Uh, he doesn't uh, try to march with what any anybody else thinks. Uh, he's to really a, an individual. I assume you're talking about he went on to go to law school and then ended up late in his life in the early 90s being an aide to Senator Jesse Helms of North Carolina. That's right. That's right. So go back to the time. W w uh, what was the attitude on the part of the administration, the Kennedy administration, about being getting involved in Mississippi early in their uh, uh. term? The attitude of the Kennedy administration was that James Meredith was going to go to the University of Mississippi that fall, that there wasn't going to be any uh, waffling about that whatsoever. And it was, it was uh, clear to me uh, six months before uh, September 1972 that the administration was determined to do everything that it could do to see that James Meredith entered the university. Did you have conversations in Mississippi or in other places in the South with white people about why they felt so strongly about keeping the blacks down? <clears throat> well, not really, because uh, uh, I, never, I, I, I can honestly say no, I don't think I ever have, because I don't think anybody ever thought that they would make any headway with me if they gave me that garbage. So a, a fellow who was born in Minneapolis but grew up in New Richmond, Wisconsin, any black folks live there? No. But let, let me tell you something. When I got to the Justice Department, um, I'm a small-town lawyer. Small-town lo lawyers investigate their own cases. Uh, there was a matter that came up in Haywood County, Tennessee in the fall of 1960. And uh, I, I uh, came into the Department of Justice one Saturday, and two of the young lawyers were reviewing a lot of FBI reports about uh, um, the efforts of a black local organization to get people in Haywood County, Tennessee, to register to vote. And that uh, as a result of that, the whole white community, the power structure of that county, lawyers, bankers, merchants, farmers, uh, taken uh, uh, collective steps to evict black sharecroppers from their farms. And uh, I decided that uh, the thing to do was to go down there and see see what was what was it about. So I went with another lawyer down to Haywood County, Tennessee, and I talked to a a young man there who was part of the Civic League, black man, and I said I believed I'd like to talk to some of the black sharecroppers who had been evicted, and he said he could arrange that. So that night or the next night, he took us out to a little black church on the gravel road. Uh, church was on four corners around cement blocks. And I went to that church and there were maybe a hundred men and women, husband and wife, sitting in the pews in that church, that little church in rural Haywood County, 1960. And I walked to the front of the church and I t explained that I was from the J Department of Justice in Washington and I was there to try to help them. And I asked, how many of you have been evicted from your farms? And every single person in the room raised their hand. Now, uh, here they were poor people, good people, honest people. Some of them had lived on the, uh, on the farms for two, three generations. They had families. Uh, sometimes they'd have two kids, sometimes they have six kids, seven kids. And uh, to think that these people were being ordered off their land, off their f in the middle of winter, 1960-61, uh, I just thought this is cruel and savage. And 
If I can do anything about it, I'm going to try. Do you have any idea where you got this kind of an attitude? Uh, well, no, no, I suppose my, 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 father. My, 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 my mother was a, was a, a very uh, broad-minded person, uh, but it, it wasn't because that she thought anything about uh, b black people. It was she. She was. She was very uh, liberal, moderate, fair with respect to r religion. Uh, but uh, I think when I was at Princeton, uh, Princeton was a really a, quite a, a southern school, and I had a number of black friends. And not black friends. I had a number of friends in, from the South. And there were no blacks at Princeton. And from time to time, I re seem to recall we'd get into discussions about the race problem in the South. And the message always was from my from the Southern classmates: we know we have a problem, but the worst thing that could happen is some Yankee comes down there and tries to do something about it. We've got to solve this for ourselves. That was in 1941, 42, 46. Well, then I go up to California to law school and and uh, then I go back to New Richmond, Wisconsin to practice law and in the spring of 1960 I read in the paper about the sit-ins by the kids in North Carolina which was, and I real, realized that you know nothing had happened nothing really had happened sure we the Brown decision had happened but as far as solving the problem nothing had happened and uh, the, the second thing about it was that uh, I always felt that Wisconsin was a, really a second-class state because it had an honest system of self-government. We had a two-party system, functioned reasonably well, and but we were competing with a one-party system in the South. And if you looked at that period of history, it didn't really ever happen that there was a senator from Wisconsin that was a powerful uh, committee chairman of one of the powerful committees in the Senate. They were always from the South, and it, it, that seemed to be if you that that uh, that uh, didn't comport with my sense of fairness, and so uh, there was a regional uh, attitude. Uh, came out of a regional attitude, at least for me, that uh, it would be good for the country, good for Wisconsin, if we could uh, eliminate the solid South. So, recapping, St. Paul's Academy High School in Minneapolis, the Twin Cities, then to Princeton. Right. Studying what? Well, just politics. From Princeton to the University of California for law school. Right. Then back to New Richmond. Right. Practiced law there in New Richmond for how long? Ten years. In, 19, in July of 1960, Harold Tyler calls you on the telephone. What was his job at the time? He was the head of the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice. And the fact was that he couldn't get anybody to take the job of his first assistant. And he had only about six months left in the Eisenhower right, administration. Right, And that's not a very attractive time to come to Washington. At the, at the tag end of an administration. And he tro he contacted his friends uh, f f in the law schools of Columbia and Harvard and Yale and lawyers he knew, and they gave him a list of people that he ought to contact, and he contacted them all, or as many as he could, and nobody wanted the job. Now, I know that because I know that from the file that was in the Justice Department afterwards. And so one day he was at a, at a party of some kind and he met a classmate of mine who was practicing law here in Washington. And he told him of his frustration. He couldn't get anybody to take the job and he offered it to him. And he said he was working for Covington and Burling and he said he couldn't take the job. But well, what was he going to do? And my friend from Covington, who was a classmate, said, well, there's that fellow up in northern western Wisconsin. Maybe he'd do it. And so he called me, and I said yes. Why? Well, because I, I wanted to do it. I, I suppose also I didn't want to 
be at this point in my life sitting in a rocking chair in a front porch in New Richmond, Wisconsin, and wondering whether I missed something. But your dad had done it all his life. Wasn't he a lawyer from there? Yeah, he was very good, too. And he, he, uh, he, uh, but he was much broader than just New Richmond, Wisconsin. Uh, he was a, a leader in the Wisconsin Bar Association. He was a counsel for a major uh, company in, in Minneapolis. He was a hell of a good trial lawyer, exceptional. So you're 39 years old, you came to Washington, served the six months with the Eisenhower administration. Who asked you to stay on and continue as first assistant to the Civil Rights Division uh, Assistant Attorney General? Well, again, Ryan, no, nobody asked me. Uh, I, I, I just worked hard and, and, uh, and I tried to let people know that I liked the job. I didn't talk to newspaper people. I didn't talk to statesmen, elected officials, and uh, uh, I, uh, Robert Kennedy. Uh, I became a, a good professional friend of Robert Kennedy's. He was always doing very nice things for me. I understand. At one time, Ethel Kennedy invited you to go out to the house and go swimming. You turned it down for you didn't want to be partisan, political. Personal. <clears throat> I don't remember that. I didn't. I never did go swimming at at uh, Ethel's house, but uh, I don't remember that. But it is true that uh, I was not partisan. I was I was devoted to working for Burke and Robert Kennedy, and I was devoted to to uh, doing the best job I could. Just to fill in the gaps, and I want to show some more uh, video. Y y when did you begin your practice of law in New York, and what kind of practice is it, and are you still active? I practiced, began after my practice in law uh, after I came back from working for Congressman Rodino. And I've been practicing in New York since that time. I'm almost finished. I have one case to argue in the Court of Appeals uh, the end of this month, but I'm not taking any more cases. Let, let me ask you a direct question. Why did you continue to work until you're now 87 years old? Well, uh, I, I, I like to work. I've always worked. Uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm restless when I'm not working. So what are you going to do for the rest of your life? Well, uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to to uh, to organize the the, the, the my pa the papers that I have, the documents I have, in the chronological order that that uh, that gives somebody who wants some historian who wants to look at them uh, easy access to them. Going to go back to the 1987 Conference of Journalists in Oxford, Mississippi. Carl Fleming, Newsweek correspondent, has a few things to say about you. Let's listen. I want to salute John Doerr. There were a lot of brave people that I saw here, mostly black, because they were really in the front lines. But the act that Claude alluded to in Jackson that day, I think, was the bravest thing I ever saw a human being do. John and I, as a matter of fact, had been having lunch. Uh, the temperature was about 103 degrees. These demonstrations had gone on for several days with no emotional outlet, no way for black people to get this terrible feeling of despair, torment, and anger and depression out of their heads. And there came this moment out in the middle of the street where there were about 300 Mississippi Highway patrolmen with repeating rifles poised against down at the other end of the street uh, after a formal demonstration, there was this moment when uh, young blacks be gathered at the end of the street and began throwing rocks. And uh, we heard this noise from where we were having lunch and jumped up and ran down there. And by the time we got there, uh, certainly there was in the air that absolutely electric feeling that we by this time had all come to recognize, that electric feeling that says something awful is about to happen because we overheard the head of the Mississippi Highway Patrol, Colonel T.D. Birdsong, say, one more rock, we're going to open fire on them. And out into this midst between these two groups strode John Doerr in his shirt sleeves. And he walked down the middle of the street 
in front of these young, angry black guys and said, gentlemen, I'm John Doerr. I'm here representing the United States government, and I've come to help you. And I think uh, someone said last night, if there's ever a statue constructed in Jackson, Mississippi, signifying this movement, it ought to be to John Doerr. Colonel Birdsong, what do you remember about him? He was the, he was the uh, commander of the state police. I don't have any clear recollection of anything about him personally. When you stepped out and put your hands up, were you at all afraid that uh, the rocks may come toward you? Well, there were a few rocks skipping along toward me, but they weren't, uh, there, I, there was no shower of rocks, uh, nothing like that. Uh, the, the, the kids were just getting kind of warmed up. And uh, if, if in those kind of situations, as I, as I think about it, because of, I certainly didn't think about it then, but it's those kind of things, it takes some time to get warmed up and, and it, it, it builds. And uh, I, I, I don't think that uh, I would ever try to do that twice. Uh, but but once uh, uh, the unusualness of what happened uh, to see uh, somebody just walk out in the middle of the street, uh, it 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 stopped. It, it people stopped, and and I knew I knew some of the black kids. At least I knew one of them, Dave Dennis, and and I hollered at Dave, "Come on, help me." Uh, let's help me get this thing quieted down. There's another uh, incident, and I know there are many of them that you were involved in. Before I ask you about the Schwerner, uh, Goodman, and Cheney incident, when did you get married? In 1947. How many children did you have? We have four. The story about your fourth child and the naming of the fourth child, I understand it went on for several weeks after the fourth child was born when he didn't have a name. That's true. It's what what happened was that, that uh, <clears throat> in 1961, uh, Anne was pregnant, and uh, we'd have, we already had two children, and uh, Judge, uh, just, it was just after the administration came into office, uh, and uh, Judge Frank Johnson called the, the office. I had never spoken to him before. He's the United States District Judge for the Middle District of Alabama, a wonderful man. And he said, I'm setting, the, setting a voting rights case in Macon County down for trial in a, sometime in early March at Opelika. And uh, um, I said, well, we'll be ready. And we need, there was some preparation to be done. And so Another lawyer, Dave Norman, and I went down to Tuskegee, Tuskegee Alabama to review voting records. Uh, at that time, just while I was there, I got a call and said that uh, Ann had delivered our first third child. Um, a, a number of, of, uh, of the secretaries in the Justice the Civil Rights Division and Burke's wife, Violet, uh, didn't uh, think it was a, uh, the right thing that I should be out of town at a time when my wife was about ready to deliver a baby. So then you go forward two years and Anne is pregnant again and it's at the time of Birmingham. And uh, the, I was just embargoed from going out of town until Burke, or the baby was born. But Birmingham was tough, there was a lot to do uh, so as soon as the baby was born, I went south again, and I probably was in, stayed in the south several weeks, or maybe more. I can't remember. So when I came back to Washington and was having a meeting of of my uh, colleagues in the Civil Rights Division, uh, Burke walked. Burke Marshall walked in. He had a hat, cap hat in his hand, and he came up to my desk and he said. Pick, pick a pick pick a card, and so I reached into the hat and pulled out a name, and it was Ross Barnett Door. The baby had not yet been named, and <laughs> another one was James Meredith Door and George Wallace Door, and uh, they everybody had a good laugh about that, 
And uh, when the meeting was over, I walked into his office and I said, well, we've got the name, it's Burke Door. After Burke Marshall? After Burke Marshall. And you named him John Burke Door. Right. Where is he today? <clears throat> well, he was here last night and was here this morning. I had breakfast with him. He's jumped back to his job in Hartford, Connecticut. He came down for that event last night. I want to run some audio tape, uh, a conversation with J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI, and the president, Lyndon Baines Johnson. You had become the assistant attorney general for civil rights. You moved up a notch. Right. And this, and we'll listen to a little bit of this, and you can explain to people what they're hearing. Uh, Mr. President, yeah. I wanted to let you know we have found the car. Yeah. Now, this is not known, nobody knows this at all, but the car was burned, and uh, we do not know yet whether any bodies are inside of the car because of the intense heat that uh, still is in the area of the car. The license plates on the car are the same that was on the car that was in uh, Philadelphia, Mississippi yesterday. And apparently, this is off to the side of the road. It wasn't t going toward Meridian, but it's going in the opposite direction. Now, whether there are anybody's in the car, we won't know until we can get into the car ourselves. We've got agents, of course, on the ground, and as soon as we get definite word, I'll, of course, get word to you. But I did want you to know that apparently what's happened, these men have been killed. Although, as I say, we can't tell whether anybody's in there in view of the intense heat. Well, now, what would make you think they've been killed? Because of the fact that it, it, it is the same car that they were in in Philadelphia. Now, that's an audio tape from an Oval Office conversation with Lyndon Johnson and J. Edgar Hoover. The bodies were found on August the 4th, 1964. There was an election coming up. You had become the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights. What's the story about Schwerner? Cheney and Goodman, and what role did you play? <clears throat> well, they were part of the what, what's known as the Mississippi Summer, uh, when Bob Moses, the student nonviolent nonviolent coordinating committee uh, representative in Mississippi, organized a uh, a summer where white kids from northern colleges would come down and help the black students uh, get people get black citizens registered to vote. And uh, 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 Mickey uh, uh, Schwerner had, had already been in Mississippi and Meridian, and uh, James Goodman was part of the summer program. And uh, he and, and then a, a black man named Cheney, the three of them went up to investigate a, a, a church burning in Neshoba County, Mississippi. And uh, they were stopped by the uh, deputy sheriff and put in jail and then released at night about 10 o'clock at a pre prearranged time. They were stopped again on the highway, taken on the side road, murdered, and then buried in a in a, an earthen dam that was being built uh, about 15 miles outside of Philadelphia. Uh, Mr. Hoover and the president are talking about the uh, vehicle, the station wagon, that they had driven to Philadelphia and and had been found about 15 miles on the other side of Philadelphia in the edge of a swamp and had been burned. What did you do after the bodies were found? Did you prosecute? Yes. We, we of course, the Bureau investigated and worked and it took, took uh, almost three years of, of investigation and grand jury hearings and no uh, more grand jury hearings and uh, dismissals and reinstatements of the indictment before we and then uh, we had a incident where there was a jury selected and then uh, somebody had released the names of the jurors to some of the lawyers for the defendants and that threw the case over another another semester so to speak finally the case came to trial in the fall of 1967 three years after the murders did you try the case? I did. Did you win? Well, we we, we got uh, convictions of uh, seven of the 16 people that we were indicted, that were indicted. Two of the 16, uh, the jurors hung. Uh, the other uh, nine were, were 
were not convicted, but this was the first time that uh, white persons were convicted for violent crimes against blacks in Mississippi. It was a it was a, a historic ver verdict. Is this the case where uh, the current governor of Mississippi, Haley Barber, went on to? Uh, encourage the prosecution later on when one of the men involved were convicted just recently. Yes, that was that was a, a man named Killian, a preacher. Uh, he's the he's the juror that uh, he's the defendant that the juror in the first trial voted eleven to one to convict, and he was uh, uh, tried again in the state court in Mississippi uh, and and was convicted. There's so much that we could talk about. I hate to keep moving, but I do want to ask you about two judges. You mentioned Judge Frank Johnson earlier. What's the difference between Judge Frank Johnson and Judge Cox? Well, about as different as night and day. Uh, Judge John Frank Johnson was a remarkable uh, trial, trial judge. He he knew what his responsibilities were under the Constitution, and every day of his life he met those responsibilities. He was white. He was white. He was district st judge. District judge, and he was from northern Alabama, of one of the counties that did not succeed a hundred years before in the Civil War. And then Judge Cox. Judge Cox was a Mississippi lawyer. I think he went to school with Senator Eastland. Uh, he was a good lawyer. Uh, he was a, a good, good trial judge on things other than civil rights matters. Um, he was awfully, uh, he was awfully tough on me when I tried my cases, bef tried the cases before him in '61, '62, '63. Uh, we finally, uh, he, I think he came to, to, to respect me. Uh, he uh, and. and uh, uh, he, he during the during the trial of the 16 people in Meridian in 1967, uh, he decided, however, he just in his mind that it was the trial was going to be fair, and he he gave uh, he gave the state the government you know a, a fair a fair trial. He was firm and. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, there was uh, Judge Johnson and Judge Cox were one-of-a-kind guys, uh, but they were different as night and day as far as the kind of guys they were. Is it fair that the journalist described you as looking like Gary Cooper and talking like Jimmy Stewart? No, it's not fair. Let, let me show you. Let me show you some video we found on the on YouTube. We'll run a little bit of it, and it will give you a reminder of something that happened in July of 1967 when 43 people were killed in Detroit. Children locked inside Black Day in July 
That's from, uh, we found that on YouTube. Um, figures involved, Lyndon Johnson, George Romney was governor of Michigan, Jerry Kavanaugh, the mayor. This was uh, July of 1967, uh, election coming up a year later. Uh, what was your role in this and what was going on? Well, uh, uh, in July 67, on a Sunday, a riot broke out in D Detroit. And uh, when I got to the office early Monday morning, uh, I was called up to the Attorney General's office, and and and, uh, and we went over to the, to the White House and met with the President, and the decision was made that Warren Christopher and Roger Wilkins and I would go out to to Detroit and uh, and uh, take a, uh, an account of just what was going on out there. So I went out to Detroit and uh, I remember getting there in the afternoon and and uh, um, I was it was it was uh, discouraging because there was there were guard people on the street, but there wasn't very much discipline in the guard as far as I could see and. Uh, Although I, I didn't uh, foresee what was going to happen that night, and then a bad riot, riot broke out, and before before the federal troops could get in and get organized and put a stop to it, what caused it? Well, I think frustration. I can't re actually remember just what was a what you'd say was the cost, but it was it, it was a '67 was a, a bad year from San time standpoint of disorder in the cities. And 43 mostly men, black men were killed. Uh, was, did blacks kill blacks or was this a situation with National Guard or federal troops killed them? I can't, you know, I just can't remember just exactly what the details of that were, so I can't respond to it. How did it all shut down eventually? Well, <clears throat> the um, the city was quadrant off into into areas, and and the um, army took charge of a couple of those uh, quadrants, and the guard took charge of the others, and the police, and and uh, I think where the difficulty happened were the areas where the uh, police and the national guard took charge of, and and uh, and, uh, and uh, it it just it was just. I, I I I was discouraged because uh, here we have had struggled and worked hard in the, in the South for seven years and were made progress. The Voting Rights Act had passed, uh, and uh, we were beginning to get what we thought believed was acceptance of the change. And then to come north, back north, and come into a major U.S. city and and see that. Disorder, the rioting, the damage, the, the deaths. Uh, it was. Uh, it. Uh, it made me think that uh, the country had a long way to go at that point. Why did you leave the administration at the end of '67? Well, I was. I was worn out. I would just finished trying the Neshoba case, and uh, this was seven and a half years, and. Uh, I thought it was time to, that the time to us, that I should move move on. And it never entered your mind that you ought to just go talk to a tape recorder and <clears throat> before you forgot all those things. No, no, it certainly didn't. It did not. It did not. And what would, that would have been the last thing I would have done. What was the difference serving in the Kennedy administration and serving in Lyndon Johnson's White House? There was uh, there was no difference as far as I was concerned, as far as the Civil Rights Division was concerned. Uh, President Johnson and the Attorney Generals that served under him were just as uh, uh, vigorous with respect to the enforcement of, of uh, civil rights laws as was Robert Kennedy and Burke Marshall and, and, of course, President Kennedy. The situation was different, however. The situation in 1965, in the spring of 1960, January 65, built on what had been going on for four years, uh, from 60 to 65. Was one administration more political about the civil rights issue than the other? Um, 
You know, that's a hard question to answer because uh, uh, there, there, I've, uh, it, it was inevitable that now that I'm now that I'm I'm older, I think, and I've thought about it more, and I've, I guess more less naive. Uh, it would be I would be silly to say that that politics didn't enter into the thinking of of both administrations. Uh, for for example, uh, President Kennedy and uh, carried those southern states of Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, I think, in, or some of them in the 1960 election. Uh, uh, he didn't want to lose those states in 64, I suppose. I know that. Not from, from I've been told that, I should say. And, uh, but uh, that didn't deter Robert Kennedy or Burke Marshall from really meeting their responsibilities with respect to uh, the law. And uh, uh, even before Burke was confirmed, uh, Robert Kennedy had taken personal interest in the first case that we had brought in Louisiana, in East Carroll Parish, and, and got involved in the first, second, third day of after he took office and uh, was on the phone talking with people to down in Louisiana trying to help a one sharecropper, one not a sharecropper, one farmer to get his cotton gin. And uh, when uh, and uh, he uh, he sent me down there uh, to see that it, uh, that the that the uh, ginners in East Carroll Parish would come before a federal judge and Tell the federal judge and in a hearing, in, but a, a hearing not off, not before the public, but on the record, that yes, they would gin Joe, Francis Joseph Adams the cotton. That was right from the right first day. I, I told you we we had too much to talk about, not enough time. So I'm going to abruptly change in the last minute and ask you, why did you take the job as counsel to Peter Rodino's Watergate committee at the time? What motivated you? I had uh, gone up to Bedford Stuyvesant in Brooklyn to work on a project that Robert Kennedy had started. Uh, I had been, Robert Kennedy had been killed. I felt that I wanted to stay and carry on that project uh, best I could. I was there for six years. A guy, I got a phone call one day from the dean of the Yale Law School. Uh, the conversation went like this. I've got one question to ask you. What's that? If you were offered the job to work for Peter Rodino, would you take it? I said yes. He said, that's all the questions I have. And he hung up. I got a call from Peter Rodino. He came down to, come down to, come down to uh, Washington to be, be interviewed. I went down. I was interviewed. We, we got along. He seemed to like me. At the end of the interview, he said, there's one other thing. I have some speeches to write. I understand you can write. I understand you could, and I want you to want to know if you'd be willing to help me draft speeches. I said, forget about it, Congressman Reno. I can't write, and oh, you're just being modest. And he hired me. Why'd you take it? Well, because um, it's a kind of a job that um, to try to do it fairly uh, was a great opportunity for a lawyer. I've had the luckiest professional experience of any lawyer in the country, bar none. And, and to have the opportunity to serve in the capacities I did, any lawyer would want that. I'm very thankful and lucky. John Doerr, we are out of time, and I thank you. Thank you. DVD copy of this program, call 1 877 662 7726. For free transcripts or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at QA.org. QA programs are also available as C SPAN podcasts.